Uh, all right. Well, I want to welcome everyone to Less is More, uh, Transforming Low-Income Communities Through Energy Efficiency. Uh, this course is approved for one hour of continuing education units in uh, US GBCI, AIHSW, AIBD, Green Certified Professionals, and may be approved for your state-based contractor or design licenses. Uh, today I will be your host. My name is Brett Little, and I am the Executive Director here at the Green Home Institute. The Green Home Institute is a nonprofit, and we are celebrating 15 years um, of existence. Um, our mission is to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. Huge thanks to our Platinum Plus sponsor, Anderson Windows and Doors, and Renewal by Anderson, who allow us to do these webinars, as well as our um, gold and silver level sponsors, Cake Systems. Certainty by Air Renew, Panasonic, Black Locust Lumber USA, and Warm Board. Um, check those guys out. Do you support greener homes? Become a member today uh, just to support the work that we do if you believe in it, to pick up free continuing education um, courses uh, or get uh, discounts on LEED and other green building certification costs. Um, so with that, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and 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 get started here today, um, and I'm gonna quick introduce um, our our two speakers. But before I, I do that, you know, I, I wanted to just um, say um, um, Habitat for Humanity. You know, we do a lot of work with several habitats around the Midwest. Um, one of them, our biggest partner, is the Kent County Habitat in 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 West Michigan and Grand Rapids. Um, and and these habitat chapters, you know, it's amazing to see the types of homes that are building being built from an energy efficiency, a health, a water conservation, and even uh, uh, the types of materials where those are coming from. Some of the habitats, like the ones in Kent County, um, have committed to green building, um, you know, lead certification on all of their projects. Um, another habitat that we work with in Grand Traverse County has got some zero energy homes that they're. Uh, they've been building and and we're doing a documentary on. So it's just amazing to see the great work that's being done on these af affordable housing projects where the homeowners actually, they're not given a house, but they actually engage in the construction process and then of course the operation of the home to ensure that it's efficient and healthy and durable for their families. Um, and so it's it's just been great to to to, to work um, as a consultant and an educator with many different habitats. And so I'm always excited to be um, uh, collaborating in many different ways um, with, uh, with, this, uh, with this great organization. Um, so with that, uh, I want to uh, introduce uh, our, 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 our second presenter first, uh, uh, Brad, uh, with the Energy and Environmental Policy advocate, advocate with 12 years of experience working in the House and Senate. Uh, and he has an extensive background in government relations and advocacy, uh, and he's an experienced energy policy analyst. And then our first presenter today, um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, who is an associate director of the Federal Relations. Um, Elizabeth supports Habitat for Humanities uh, International's domestic policy and advocacy efforts, along with the implementation of its advocacy strategic initiatives. Before joining Habitat for Humanity International, she was the Director of Governmental Relations for Louisiana Association of Nonprofit Organizations in New Orleans and the Director of Public Policy for Business Professional Women, uh, USA, Washington, D.C. She also served as a staff assistant to former um, Senator Joseph Biden of Delaware on Capitol Hill. So with that, Elizabeth, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you to, to take us away. Thank you so much, Brett. Um, really appreciate that very kind introduction, and it's really wonderful to be with you all. Um, as Brett mentioned, uh, my name is Elizabeth Gale. I'm the Associate Director of Federal Relations for Habitat for Humanity International, and um, Brad and I are really thrilled to be presenting Habitat's 2015 shelter report entitled Enabling Low-Income Energy Efficiency. And so we um, want to give you a little bit of background. Um, first, this is uh, an overview of the presentation that we'll be giving today. I want to give you a, a brief sense about Habitat's interest in energy efficiency first to start off with. And then Brad will be talking about the related problems of energy and affordable housing facing low-income Americans 
and then um, what we can do in the near term, and he's going to give some really great ideas, innovative ideas and best practices of how we can um, provide residential low-income um, energy efficiency um, to low-income families and, and how to do that in cost-effective and innovative ways. So um, with that, just to give you a little bit of background about Habitat's um, interest and history around energy efficiency, Habitat really is committed to energy efficient practices that will lower energy costs and increase health and safety measures and reduce um, homes monthly and life cycle costs for our partner families. You know, we recognize as an affordable housing home ownership organization, we recognize there's more to owning a home and paying a mortgage, you know, while providing a partner family a home for an affordable price with a fair mortgage term is essential. Those steps alone are not sufficient to ensure long-term affordability. Our partner families, for them to become successful homeowners, they must be able to afford other essential expenses like utilities. And as we know, low-income families typically face a higher energy cost than, um, than other families. And so it's really vital that we build <clears throat> and rehab and repair homes to high energy efficient standards. And right now, many of our Habitat affiliates, as Brett mentioned, um, are building to energy efficient standards, um, such as LEED Platinum, and many are leading the way um, in residential energy efficiency and housing markets across the country. So it's a really exciting area for us, and it really um, blends so well with our model. Um, <clears throat> Habitat, in 2011, we secured our first grant from the Department of Energy. We received one of the 16 Weatherization Innovation Pilot Program grants. Um, it was a $3 million grant to retrofit um, homes across the United States. That was a very um, exciting opportunity for us to partner with the Department of Energy and to receive um, support to do that type of work. And that's something that um, in recent years, Brad and I um, have had the opportunity to do some advocacy together to build on the success of the WIP grant. And in uh, the last year, legislation has been introduced in the House and Senate called the Weatherization Enhancement and Local Energy Efficiency Investment and Accountability Act, which is quite a mouthful, um, by Senators Coons, Reed, and Collins um, on the Senate side and Congressman Tonko on the House side. And that legislation would reauthorize the Weatherization Assistant Program and State Energy Program for another five years, which are two very strong, important federal programs um, for providing um, residential energy efficiency retrofits to low-income families, which Brad will talk more about in his presentation. But it would also authorize a new competitive grant program that would allow multi-state nonprofits like Habitat with a track record in energy efficiency to compete for a small percentage of the Weatherization Assistance Program fund funding. And so we've been um, advocating for that legislation. So not only has Habitat been involved in um, sort of the building side of energy efficiency, but we've gotten more involved in the advocacy and policy side of energy efficiency as well. And um, so we're really excited about that. And so finally, I would say all of that led to our decision to um, do the shelter report uh, this year and have it focus on energy efficiency. Um, my office, the Government Relations and Advocacy Office, issues a shelter report every single year. We pick an issue that we feel like is important to Habitat that particular year. We um, alternate between domestic and international issues, um, and this year was a domestic issue when we felt like residential energy efficiency, um, because it is such a hot topic um, in general right now, but also in a, of importance to Habitat and because of our work with um, Brad and his colleagues on the bill in Congress and, and after our WIP grant, we felt like this would be a really great time to do a report. And so it's been a really great pleasure to work with Brad this past year around developing the report and now getting the word out about the report. And, <clears throat> and hopefully, you know, it can <clears throat> inform all of you about um, what's happening in the field right now around residential energy efficiency and what are some innovative ideas and best practices that, um, you know, that states and practitioners can learn from um, so that we can provide the financing and the resources that 
low-income families really need to be able to make their homes more energy efficient. So with that, I will turn it over to Brad so that he can sort of dive into the report and start talking about the findings. Um, so I will go be going to the next slide. And Brad, I turn it to you. Elizabeth, thank you very much, and thanks to our audience for being with us today. We appreciate everyone's flexibility in uh, doing the webinar uh, on a rescheduled basis, and it's been a tremendous uh, opportunity for me and a great partnership with Habitat for Humanity at working on the shelter report, and I'm just delighted that we have the opportunity today to, for Elizabeth and I to present uh, some of the findings and, and our recommendations for policy going forward. As Elizabeth said, residential energy efficiency and particularly the challenge facing low-income Americans is a great uh, problem in the United States. <clears throat> ACEEE has recently uh, increased their percentage of total energy consumption attributable to residential energy use to almost 25 percent, typically been quoted recently as being in the range of uh, 22 percent, but ACEEE has adjusted that figure upwards, showing the importance of residential energy efficiency. And $230 billion spent annually, you see, on home energy by Americans. And when you look at the disproportionate burden, <clears throat> excuse me, on low-income households, uh, they're spending, uh, and these, the data here comes from my work in the Weatherization Assistance Program, where we did breakdowns of uh, low-income spending on energy in all of the states, and it ranges between, you know, 17 percent of disposable income up to, in some cases, in states with very high poverty rate, uh, 50 percent of disposable income just to heat and cool uh, their, their households, obviously a great burden. Middle class Americans, on the other hand, spend only about 4 to 5 percent for home energy. And while there are great programs, Elizabeth talked a lot about weatherization, uh, unfortunately, they reach only a very, very small percentage of the eligible clients. Uh, in the 29-year history of the weatherization program, 7.4 million homes have been weatherized. But there are today uh, more than 30 million additional homes that are eligible for weatherization. Okay. So looking at the combined energy and housing uh, low-income burden, uh, we saw those very high percentages that the low-income Americans are paying for their energy costs. And then when you add in the cost of housing, uh, you see how it, it really, in, in many instances, is a, is a crushing burden that low-income Americans face. Um, 18 million Americans paying more than 50 percent of their annual incomes just for housing. That's taking not into account energy costs. And according to the HUD website, a family with one full-time worker earning the minimum wage cannot afford the local fair market rent value for a two-bedroom apartment anywhere in the United States. And then a report issued earlier this year by the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies showing that the most severely burdened households in America spend 70% less on health care and 40% less on food than middle-class Americans. So what can we do on the energy side? My presentation for the next 40 minutes is going to focus uh, not on the housing side, but on what we can do on the energy side. And here you see the, uh, the barrier being the lack of available financing, upfront financing for energy upgrades, okay? So given the critical importance of coming up with funding, uh, low-income Americans, middle-income middle Americans are severely challenged came up with funding uh, to make the kind of energy upgrades that would reduce their, their energy bills. And of course, for low-income Americans, uh, it's, it's out of the question uh, unless they're fortunate enough to be part of programs like weatherization. And on-bill financing is a fairly new concept, although it's already in 23 states and many of the states have legislative uh, enabling acts for uh, on-bill financing. Um, what it is, is this is a way for the utilities to work with their customers to provide the upfront funding so it reduces or eliminates the first cost for customers uh, to make energy upgrades 
And it's, again, based on the existing relationship between customers and utilities. Um, the funding is tied to the property through the meter, so it works in both a rental as well as an ownership situation, the debt transferring across the you know, prospective future owners and tenants. Um, it can be structured as either a loan or a tariff, um, and the purchase or installation of the energy upgrades is initially paid for by the utility or by a, a third-party uh, financial uh, lending institution. And, you know, in addition to third-party lenders, you can have a funding source for the uh, upgrades through public benefits charges, uh, federal grants or loans, uh, or a utility can establish a loan loss reserve program. So just briefly identify, we, we don't have time to go into all of the other financing mechanisms. I think that on-bill financing for low-income customers is probably the most realistic. Um, there are emerging uh, tools like social impact bonds, which is kind of a pay for success where government can set a, a goal like, for instance, uh, wanting to have 20% more weatherized homes in a particular geographic area and then engaging with a third party kind of in an ESCO type situation uh, and paying the third party based on the success of the project. Uh, so that's the social impact bond the government pays only if they get their objective, in, in the case I mentioned, an increase in 20% of weatherized homes, obviously risk on the part of the third party that assumes that obligation. Green leases negotiated directly between tenants uh, and the, uh, the owners, and of course that's a greater challenge, um, but it, it is beginning to uh, be a trend that we're, we're observing in a number of states. And we'll talk later about the ESCOs in their role in uh, doing upgrades in uh, public housing. And we'll also talk in a, a few minutes here about the role of the residential uh, PACE programs, property uh, assessed clean energy bonds, and how that can be a very, very effective tool. Okay. So what is really needed to do energy efficiency financing? Working with the utilities is absolutely critical. And one thing that many people don't realize, uh, ACEEE has identified that utilities spend eight billion with a B annually on state ratepayer funded energy efficiency programs throughout the United States. That's a lot of money when you look at the size of the weatherization program, you know, sadly recently has been in the range of 200 million because of the federal budget difficulties. And so this is an enormous source of funding. Unfortunately, very, very little of it up to this point has been spent on low-income programs. So that's where working with the utilities on the part of advocates uh, in the future is, is going to be so, so important. Uh, just mention a couple of the other uh, sources of upfront capital. Many states have revolving funds and reaching out to, uh, to third-party lenders is, is also critical. A number of banks have begun to become active. Deutsche Bank is one, and uh, there, there are others that have become active in putting up some of the, uh, the upfront funding uh, to take care of energy upgrades. So let's talk for a minute about green banks, because that's another, in addition to the on-bill financing, a uh, very exciting tool that is just emerging. Uh, Connecticut is kind of the model for that. It's a government-created uh, financial institution. Uh, and in the case of Connecticut, and I think this really will be the model for green banks in other states, um, it's not a state appropriation. Uh, money these days directly appropriated is very hard to come by. So what the green bank in Connecticut does, it uses lower interest rates, loan loss reserves, other market supports to uh, promote clean energy projects. And so far in Connecticut, it's been very, very successful since the first one uh, was created there in the year 2012. Other states, uh, the green bank is part of state agencies. For instance, New York has a green bank that's part of NYSERDA, state energy agency. Hawaii, the same thing. Um, California has legislation to authorize a green bank, and at the time, uh, the present time, the state treasurer of California acts as the green bank, and they issue bonds 
uh, which among other things can be used for uh, for PACE, residential PACE, which we'll be talking about here in just a minute. So that's the, the very exciting potential in the future for green banks. Okay. So I mentioned residential PACE, and that's something that is really emerging property assessed clean energy bonds. So while PACE is frequently thought of more in the commercial building context, uh, there's a lot of residential PACE activity going on. It allows a state or local government to fund 100% of the upfront costs for clean energy projects and the assessments are made a part of the uh, property tax bill, which the customer pays on an annual basis. And the financing is tied to the property. Indeed, uh, the assessment is a recorded lien. This has been the issue with PACE, which many of you who are with us today will know that back in the year 2010, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which are the two uh, leading federal uh, mortgage uh, entities, um, objected to the uh, you know the senior lien status for PACE uh, on the theory this would be somehow you know subordinating the importance of the uh, the mortgages on the property. So there's been several responses uh, to this as the years have gone by. First, there's legislation pending in Congress uh, to try to uh, in effect overturn that. Um, a number of states have worked around it. For instance, in Vermont and Maine. Uh, the liens for the uh, residential PACE have been uh, put under or second in line to the mortgage trust instrument. So that satisfies the mortgage lenders and has enabled PACE to, uh, to go forward. Um, right now, there are uh, more than 20 states that have uh, PACE legislation. And in terms of residential PACE, it's happening uh, now in uh, California, in Missouri. New York, Texas, and Virginia. Virginia just passed a residential PACE law. And so it's something that uh, you know we see uh, with its potential for paying 100% of a project cost uh, with a repayment occurring over 20 years with the assessment added to the property tax. We see that as a very, very practical tool for funding clean energy improvements in the future for residences. So let's talk for just a minute about where energy efficiency is most urgently needed for low-income customers. <clears throat> the three areas, manufactured housing, uh, multifamily housing, and I mentioned subsidized housing. We're, we're going to talk briefly about each of those, okay? Manufactured housing uh, represents 7% of the housing stock in the United States, largely in low-income rural areas. Uh, 17 million Americans are residents of mobile homes, and mobile homes are the most energy inefficient form of housing uh, anywhere. And uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of health and safety issues related to uh, uh, manufactured housing, particularly uh, the manufactured housing built before the year 1976 when there were no HUD standards at all. And uh, those are real clunkers today. And because they were issued uh, before any HUD standards existed, HUD will not uh, make funds available for retrofits. So what I have advocated for at the Alliance to Save Energy and uh, in the work that I've done with Habitat and other clients is a cash for clunkers program. Some of you may remember that uh, back in the early days of the uh, stimulus uh, at the depth of the um, severe recession five, six years ago, a cash for clunkers program uh, whereby states would use revolving funds and other sources of capital uh, to buy back uh, the, the pre-1976 clunkers or manufactured homes that do not have standards uh, and you know, provide fun a funding source for people to replace them uh, because new uh, manufactured housing, uh, much of it is highly energy efficient, the new, the new stock. So the problem is providing, once again, providing the capital uh, for residents to make those upgrades or to trade out uh, a clunker mobile home uh, to get a, uh, an energy efficient one. You see the median annual income for residents of manufactured housing at just $30,000 a year, just a little bit above the poverty level for a family of four. 
and residents of manufactured housing spending more than twice as much on energy per square foot compared to the occupants of site-built homes. So obviously that's a very, very high priority. HUD has a uh, manufactured housing standard, which they've been sitting on, and uh, advocates need to pressure HUD to, uh, to issue that standard quickly. Okay, so let's talk for a minute about multifamily. Multifamily is overwhelmingly low income, 30% of the U.S. population living in multifamily housing tends to be older properties. And multifamily, for a variety of reasons, has been overlooked in terms of energy efficiency. Um, the reason is that it's the split incentive. <clears throat> the owner of a multifamily property isn't going to get the benefit of the, uh, the improvements in the tenant's units, the energy efficiency improvements, reducing energy bills, the benefit would inure to the tenant and not the owner. And likewise, the tenant doesn't really have the incentive to spend money to make an energy upgrade, assuming they had the capital to do so, because they don't own the units. You know, they're just tenants, so they're going to be moving on. So that is a really, really big challenge, and uh, I'm involved in an activity right now in Virginia to try to work with the utility, in that case uh, Dominion, uh, to uh, see if we can get uh, programs underway through the uh, utility, I uh, mentioned the ratepayer money, uh, to try to get a healthy chunk of that devoted to um, energy efficiency upgrades in multifamily housing. Um, On-bill financing can be a way of getting around the split incentive uh, because there it's the same as a little bit like residential pace in that the bill can be tied to the unit. So in other words, that, that can be something that an incoming tenant uh, would it, would assume or take over uh, for the outgoing tenant, namely the cost of the energy efficiency upgrade. So there are ways of dealing with a split incentive, but up to this point in time, it's been a real barrier. And there you see the gain on the upside, uh, $3.4 billion in annual utility bills with multifamily upgrades. Okay. Lastly, let's just talk for a minute about low-income subsidized housing. Uh, Five percent of Americans living in subsidized housing, and obviously a tremendous opportunity going forward. And, and this is a business opportunity for the energy savings performance contractors. And there have been programs in um, the uh, shelter report that Elizabeth mentioned. We we talk about one in Rochester, New York, where an ESCO came in under a contract with a uh, lo local uh, low-income housing project. And they did energy upgrades and uh, saved the tenants a lot of money. And, uh, again, if you can find the funding source, in the case of the ESCO, they don't get paid unless energy efficiency happens. They assume the risk, uh, a little bit like the uh, social impact bonds. The ESCO assumes the risk of making the uh, energy improvements and they get paid out of the savings. So, you know, that, that solves the funding problem. And HUD, the current secretary, uh, Mr. Castro, is very pro-energy efficiency. HUD is trying to push this. So, you know, there's good reason to believe that um, there'll be greater uh, efficiency in the, in the near future in uh, low-income subsidized housing. Let's talk for a minute about the need to raise awareness. Uh, one of the real problems that we identified in the shelter report is the lack of awareness of existing programs. And, uh, you know, that that's, goes throughout our entire society. It applies as much to uh, the awareness of on-bill financing uh, on the part of middle-class Americans. Um, people just don't know about it. It's considered to be something that is kind of, uh, you know, it sounds like a difficult burden to take on the added cost on your energy bill. Uh, people are afraid of getting involved with government agencies. You know, they don't want to take on the paperwork burden. So there is a tremendous need for public education and awareness targeting low-income households, and it's got to be a very creative and targeted awareness campaign for low income because there are 51 million Americans uh, that are not on the Internet. That's 15% of our population, according to the Pew research report issued earlier this year. Um, that is a tremendous barrier. So uh, is this going to be a radio or media campaign? 
Uh, this is something that the Alliance to Save Energy did with great success. Some of you may remember about 35 years ago, there was a national campaign and the spokesperson was the actor Gregory Peck. This is when energy efficiency was uh, just kind of a, a new kid on the block, so to speak. And it, it did make a tremendous impact on public awareness of uh, how money can be saved in, the, in very, very uh, fast and simple ways. And that's the kind of national campaign that we need right now targeted to uh, low-income households. So I mentioned earlier the very stringent federal budget and, the, of course, the uncertainty in the FY 2016 budget right now. We, we're into the new fiscal year, uh, almost a full month into it. <clears throat> we don't have a budget for FY 16. We're operating on a continuing resolution, which ties support for weatherization to the prior year's level. Um, one thing that I hear as an advocate in almost every meeting that I do on Capitol Hill and I'm sure Elizabeth getting the same message for Habitat, we need to have much louder support from people who support programs like weatherization, the state energy program, LIHEAP, which is, by the way, the single biggest funder of weatherization is the LIHEAP program. And the HUD, particularly the HOPE 6 programs, uh, which promote efficiency in uh, low-income housing. Um, our communities, and I would invite everyone who's part of the call today uh, to join in this, need to reach out directly to their members of Congress, uh, tell them why weatherization and LIHEAP are critically important programs for low-income Americans. But we need to uh, have a much louder voice on the Hill because in the very stringent uh, budget climate right now, unless we start making a lot more noise, Unfortunately, programs like weatherization, uh, they get down to the $200 million level, uh, they, they receive very, very little attention on the part of, of members of Congress. So that's where the, the direct constituent meetings in the home state, in, it's not necessary to come to Washington. You can arrange meetings in Milwaukee or elsewhere with, uh, with your congressional delegation members during the congressional recess period. And as we identify here on the slide, the importance of building coalitions between efficiency and affordable housing groups. This is something that I'm doing right now in the multifamily project I mentioned in Virginia, uh, where we found that the stakeholder organizations were completely separate in the way they were approaching their good work. Um, the efficiency organizations didn't talk to the affordable housing organizations and vice versa. That needs to be changed. We need to lobby to make low-income housing tax credits permanent. That is an incredibly huge source uh, of private sector uh, low-income uh, construction. And we, as I said, we need to bring the success stories to Capitol Hill. We do have great champions, a few of them mentioned on the slide here. Uh, we need more of those champions, and the only way we're going to do that is bring the great success stories of weatherization and other programs. And in the shelter report, we profile a number of them, uh, particularly uh, some of the partnership programs in New Orleans that uh, Elizabeth was involved with before coming up to Habitat in, in Washington, D.C. And those public-private uh, sector partnerships have been uh, very instrumental in bringing uh, tremendous energy efficiency in low-income communities. Baltimore is, is another example. Another area that advocates need to emphasize and important for those who are participating in the webinar today is the non-energy benefits of energy efficiency. You may have seen there was a report released earlier this year. Uh, it was a study done in Michigan of a very uh, small sample of weatherization projects in Michigan. This was a study done by some academicians at the University of Chicago and it questioned the energy benefit, the payback in terms of energy savings from the federal investment in the weatherization program, which of course is $200 million a year, very, very modest investment. But the study, and in our work to rebut it, the study neglected to address the non-energy benefits. This is something advocates need to do a much better job in bringing out uh, for the public to understand and policymakers to understand, there are tremendous health and safety benefits in many cases, weatherization 
uh, the, the only intervention in a low-income home may be when the workers come in to do weatherization and notice, for instance, a carbon monoxide problem, uh, which can have critical safety implications if it's not corrected. And uh, so weatherization produces benefits like that. It, it uh, cuts down on mold and moisture, which can be linked to respiratory-related illnesses, particularly in low-income and minority populations. Um, mold, uh, other you know, health-related problems that are your endemic in older, um, you know, low-income properties. The NASCAP organization, which I work with, which is the represents the state agencies implementing weatherization, have what's called a Healthy Homes Initiative, uh, which is a way of combining weatherization with um, work directed at some of these health-related and indoor air quality issues, particularly. Low-income populations have a much higher incidence of the uh, income, low-income issues related to indoor air quality. We spend 90% of our lives indoors. And in homes that are highly energy inefficient, may have mold and moisture, that is obviously a, a health threat to the populations that, that live there. Other non-energy benefits of investing in efficiency include a higher property valuation and tax revenues once weatherization or energy upgrades have been implemented. Community revitalization and things as simple as the pride that people have in their communities. There are actually entire communities in uh, southern Ohio uh, that are, have been 90% of the homes have been uh, weatherized. Uh, these are model uh, programs, and uh, you know the sense of community pride, the revitalization of communities, has followed the um, the commitment to do the weatherization work on virtually every single home. These are small communities, uh, but the impact on the local population has been huge. So the other thing is that uh, program evaluation, the cost effectiveness evaluation, which is a subject for another another day's webinar only measures the direct costs versus the reduction in energy bills. And this is a critical factor in the ratepayer money that I mentioned that is controlled by the utilities in that they use this cost effectiveness testing to measure the, um, the benefit of doing energy efficiency upgrades. And if you're only looking at the direct costs uh, versus reduction in energy bills. You're missing this entire dimension of, of health and community benefit that, uh, that we've been talking about. So that really undervalues energy efficiency. Uh, that might be uh, a future webinar to talk just about cost effectiveness testing and how we can get uh, better protocols in the future that do fairly measure uh, the real impact of energy efficiency, which is uh, considerably more than than just the, the energy savings. So there we, we talk about some of the other uh, important uh, tools that can be, be part of the, uh, the work of energy efficiency. We talked about public-private partnerships. The Baltimore example we, we discuss at some length in the shelter report if you're interested in learning more about that. So let's talk for just a minute about what is uh, happening or not happening at the federal level. I'm sure everyone participating in the call is aware of the continuing congressional gridlock. Very frustrating to those of us. I spent most of the summer working on comprehensive energy bills that are pending right now in the House and Senate. Unfortunately, the uh, House bill became a very, very partisan, and uh, most of the advocacy organizations like Alliance to Save Energy oppose it. Uh, it contains, among other things, provisions in there that would really gut the role of the Department of Energy in the development of building energy codes. So the House bill uh, reported on a partisan basis. It may come up in the full House. It passed the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Now on the House calendar, may come up sometime in November, but there are very few legislative days left this year. And as I'm sure everyone knows, there is a mountain, a very tall mountain, of work that must be done on the budget, on the debt ceiling, on the uh, highway bill, on the reauthorization of the export import bank could go on and on. So the odds of an energy bill coming up are in the limited number of legislative days uh, slim and none. Same in the Senate, the even fewer legislative days. That bill is better from an energy efficiency perspective, although it does have some bad language in there relating to uh, standards for uh, furnaces. Um, but um, it's a better bipartisan bill than, than the House bill. 
And let me just mention that uh, the president, given this gridlock on the Hill, is using his executive authority to issue uh, very aggressively appliance and equipment standards. So this is a, an initiative that goes way back, and, and Republican presidents have signed, interestingly enough, all of the uh, legislation <clears throat> which has given the Department of Energy the authority to issue uh, appliance and equipment standards. ACEEE estimates that American households save at least $250 each and every year just to to appliance and equipment standards. For instance, home refrigerators compared to 30 years ago, about 80% increase in efficiency uh, and, of course, an increase in capacity of the refrigerator at the same time. But these standards have produced dramatic savings in energy efficiency, building energy codes, a very good example. Uh, the advocates want to resist uh, efforts on Capitol Hill to uh, undo these standards. There have been for instance, I mentioned the furnace standard. There have been other efforts on uh, things as uh, uh, far-fetched as uh, ceiling fans to try to uh, put a, a rider on appropriations bills that would block the Department of Energy from ever issuing a standard on, on ceiling fans. These are all areas where the advocates have to be vigilant and have to be prepared to uh, – we're, we're playing defense largely on Capitol Hill – uh, to get our champions to step up and try to beat back these these efforts to undermine uh, appliance and equipment standards. So let me talk for uh, as we get towards the end here of the uh, the webinar the very very important opportunities in the EPA power plan. Everyone knows the rule that was issued in August and which by the way is going to finally appear tomorrow in the Federal Register. Uh, it was issued by EPA the beginning of August, but didn't formally get printed in the Federal Register until tomorrow. That's significant because that triggers the 60-day period uh, for organizations opposed to the rule to file lawsuits, and I'm sure there will be many of them uh, starting tomorrow. But in terms of efficiency and low-income communities, um, let's take a look at the, uh, the important role that energy efficiency can play in meeting state targets. Um, these standards, by the way, are going to be phased in uh, gradually uh, through uh, the year 2030 when they will be in place. And there's a great deal of flexibility for states in the design and implementation uh, of their plans. Uh, for instance, states could use uh, emissions trading or demand-side energy efficiency programs. Renewables obviously have a major uh, role to play. The state plans are due in September of 2016, but under the rule, the states can request extensions of up to two years, and it's expected that uh, a lot of states will do that. So I want to talk about the Clean Energy Incentive Program, and this is uh, there to drive uh, investment in low-income energy efficiency. And this is going to be done in a uh, geographic uh, basis. Uh, low-income communities, of course, <clears throat> you know, there are some definitional problems, what constitutes a low-income community, but this can provide funding uh, for uh, low-income families, households, small businesses, and the important thing here for the advocates is there's been very little messaging and outreach uh, to low-income businesses and communities on the opportunity, and of course for the state governments, there's a real incentive here because under the, uh, the Clean Energy Incentive Program, the states would get double the number of credits, uh, double the number of carbon credits in the years 2020 and 2021 if they invest in efficiency in low-income communities. So, you know, that, that's a lot of incentive. So what we as advocates need to do is to really market this, this opportunity in low-income communities. We need to identify low-income businesses, uh, small businesses, um, households, public housing, where multifamily projects where there could be just a, a transformative effect um, as to what will happen with the court challenges, you know, no one, no one can predict. But uh, the state governments are going forward and uh, other organizations are, are out there, the stakeholder groups are out there, each trying to get their own 
uh, angle uh, built into the estate plans, and so the low-income communities need to be doing the same thing. So I think that's going to conclude the uh, formal part of the uh, presentation. Um, just I would say in, in wrapping up, while it is very frustrating, those of us who work at the federal level to see the continuing gridlock in Congress, uh, playing defense successfully is very, very important. Uh, the cuts in programs like LIHEAP and weatherization would be even deeper if the advocates weren't there to fight for them. That's why we need a louder voice. We need your help to make that happen. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of opportunity at the state level today in energy efficiency for low-income communities, working with state energy offices, working with the clean power plan, uh, state plans that are going to be formulated uh, over the next several years is critically important. There is a big role to play here for advocacy organizations, and uh, uh, I know speaking on behalf of Habitat, the Alliance to Save Energy, uh, the other organizations that uh, that we work with here collectively in Washington, D.C., we invite you to become our partners to reach out uh, to your congressional delegations and to get involved at the state level in the Clean Power Plan uh, rule and the uh, low-income programs that will be developed uh, underneath it. Um, it may be that in the near future, given the stringency of the federal budget, we need to look to both the uh, the state programs and to public-private partnerships uh, to make the most transformative breakthroughs in energy efficiency. And lastly, of course, working with utilities, critically important on the financing issues uh, such as on bill financing. So with that, I'm going to stop and I'm going to turn it back to Elizabeth and Brett. And if there are any questions, um, I'd be uh, delighted, as I know Elizabeth would, to, uh, to have a dialogue with you. Thank you for listening. All right. Well, uh, thanks, Brad and um, Elizabeth there. Um, this is Brett here, and, and we do have a, a couple questions coming in. Um, and for those of you who have any questions, feel free to drop them uh, right into the, the Q&A there. Um, so this one from uh, Jim. Um, when you speak of split incentives, has there been any research to identify how many multifamily units have tenant-paid heating? In our market, most older buildings are centrally heated, uh, I think with a boiler, and master metered and paid by the owner. Yeah, I think from my perspective, uh, I would say that yes, I think that that's, that's accurate. To, I've, I've researched that there's only 5% of multifamily buildings are master metered. So there, you, you know, you don't have to deal with the, the split incentive because, you, you know, that's, that's going to be the owner paying the utilities. But that's only five percent. Elizabeth, what are your thoughts on that? Um, honestly, I don't know since we're our focus is single family. Oh, right. Um, no. I don't. I'm sorry. I don't. I don't know. Um, I don't have a strong enough knowledge of of multifamily data. But, um, but it's a great. I mean, it's a great point and interesting issue. Certainly, split incentive has been a huge barrier. Because, uh, you know, if neither the owners nor the tenants have incentive to do energy upgrades, nothing's going to happen. Um, I think the exciting thing about green banks, and especially on bill financing, is it can provide a very realistic way, you know, let's say you have a situation where it's a multifamily property and, uh, you know, the units are, the, the utility is paid by the tenants in each unit. And if you can work out a contract with the tenant, uh, whereby they receive the upfront on bill financing. Uh, you work to get the payment revenue neutral so that the amount that the tenant is paying under the contract is as is, is close to his regular utility bill as possible and maybe even going in the other direction of providing a cut. And then the, the contract follows the unit. So let's say the tenant after two or three years moves out, an incoming tenant is going to assume the balance of that uh, repayment on the on-bill financing. And studies have shown that the default rate on um, utility bills is much lower uh, than for other types of, of services because people need to heat and cool their homes. So getting shut off is you know, not good. So that's a reason to hope that on-bill financing can overcome this great challenge of the split incentive. Um. 
Speaking about uh, green banks, and you had mentioned that uh, there seems to be a pretty strong one there in Connecticut. Is that any way um, connected to that, their their recent allow, uh, announcement of doing massive amounts of home energy score labeling in the state, and if that has any connection to um, low income housing? You know, I don't know if the Connecticut Green Bank is directly involved in in that or not. I could look into it and be glad, Brett, to, to let you know. I would it would certainly make sense for funding from the uh, Green Bank um to, to be involved. Although as I said, in the case of Connecticut, it's not a direct appropriation from the Connecticut legislature. It's things like, you know, guarantees, loan loss reserves, other market supports. So that's something we'd have to look into. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and yes, yeah, everybody, please uh, continue to put your questions in here. I guess this one is more of a um, more of a comment, um, and but it, it mentions that uh, for on-bill financing in Illinois, the full amount must be repaid if the account holder changes. Is that, that doesn't that's not pretty typical though of of, of on-bill financing, is it? Well, the entire amount does does have to be paid at, at some point, yes. So, in other words, the way it would typically work, one of the barriers, and this is a good time to, to mention it, is the utilities don't want to assume a creditor relationship. And that's why I mentioned, you know, third parties uh, as being or really becomes what's referred to as on-bill payment. Uh, if it's a third party working with the, uh, uh, the utility, um, because yes, there has to be a guarantee of repayment. If the tenant leaves, there has to be a contractual relationship for the unit so that a tenant coming in uh, is going to assume that cost. Now there is, you know, people have said, okay, what are the weaknesses in on-bill financing? Here's one. What if you get into a marketing type problem of the owner has, has you know, made the commitment to work with the utilities, uh, he gets his uh, building 100% on bill financing for for the tenants. A number of them leave, and he can't replace them. There is a legal issue as to whether the building owner would then be legally responsible for the payback of that of the upfront energy upgrade costs. So that, for participants to know, is a weakness that has not yet been worked through in on bill financing. It works so long as the tenant is there uh, to, to pay, and as I said, the goal is to drive the, the total cost of the tenant to a revenue neutral situation where he's paying once a month for both his utility and the repayment of the energy upgrade, but the, price, the overall price is about the same as his regular utility bill. If you can drive it to that point, and in New York State they've been successful in doing that, you've got a good program. Um, the, the the issue where there is still this this question of liability, apart from the reluctance of utilities to become creditors, but assuming you get past that point, is this question of liability in a tenant situation um, if you can't fill the vacant unit that has an on-bill financing contract on it, uh, then who pays? Great, thanks. Um... You know, speaking of, of uh, energy efficiency um, programs, and uh, I'm glad you brought up that uh, that study there in in Michigan, where where, right. where I'm from, actually. I uh, uh, when I saw that come out, I was like, oh no, now I got to work three times as hard to to get the message out there. But you know, um, right. you know, I'm, I'm glad you pointed out the health and durability features of that not being weighted in that um, in the benefits. But one other thing I was wondering, and if, and if you guys have looked into or, or, or saw, one of the other um, rebuttals that I had saw was that the fact that a lot of these um, programs did not have any kind of third-party performance testing or energy modeling components to them that ensured that applications were actually installed correctly and performing correctly um, so that the actual savings could be, be realized. Have you um, have you been looking into that at all? Yeah, there, there are two or three. That's that's actually a really really great question, and there are two or three dimensions to that. In the weatherization assistance program, there there is a requirement for auditing, uh, and there's a nice incentive for the contractor to do the job right, because as you may know, 
uh, the DOE weatherization program doesn't pay for callbacks. So if you get to the end of the day and the unit uh, is audited and there's a problem, then the contractor is going to absorb the cost of going back uh, under DOE direction to correct correct the uh, the issue. So that that's point number one. Two, the DOE weatherization program is evaluated by uh, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. In fact, DOE has just released a major national evaluation within the last several months, which does rebut the findings of this Michigan study, which, as I said, was done on a very small sliver of weatherized units in just in one section of, of Michigan and totally not looking at the non-energy benefits. But that national evaluation, I think, provides some validation, Brett, of the uh, the importance and the worth of the investment and, and uh, Oak Ridge is increasingly looking at how do you measure the non-energy benefits. That's the real challenge. How do you look at the indoor air quality benefits, the, you know, getting rid of the threat of mold and moisture, uh, you know, right on whatever. Um, how do you really capture, put an economic value on those those benefits? And, and I know Oak Ridge and other places are are dealing with that now, and I just uh, happened to hear within the last week there's an efficiency advocate by the name of Steve Cowell who has a new nonprofit in New England. He's been very active in weatherization in the New England states, and he has uh, just hired a Ph.D. who has a background apparently in this kind of analysis, and she is going to do a major study on that very question of putting an economic value on the non-energy benefits of, of these kind of upgrades. Great. Thanks, Brad. Uh, yeah, let me make a concluding. I, can I say just before we go up, I, I apologize for interrupting. Oh, we, but we do have a few more questions, so we don't have to conclude yet. Good, good, because I yeah. want to ask yeah. folks before we get too much past the, uh, the conclusion of this, the weatherization day is October 30th. It would be great if people listening and participating today could put out statements, tweet uh, a message of the importance of weatherization and low-income energy efficiency. It's, it's October 30th. Uh, DOE is going to be releasing, uh, you know, they'd be making their own statements. We have plans in a number of states for governors to do events um, in New Hampshire, for example. Uh, they have like a whole weatherization day of activities in which the governor is going to be participating. So, uh, you know, that's a great opportunity. This, what I spoke about during the presentation of the need for messaging um, is critical. So if, if I could just pass that along to our participants, uh, if nothing else, get on social media on weatherization day, October 30th. Great. Um, Here's a question for Elizabeth from uh, Julie. Um, Elizabeth, can you share more about what specific energy efficiency measures Habitat is installing that are the most cost effective? Thank you. That is a great question. Um, so Habitat um, has been doing a number of things sort of in this um, energy efficiency realm. And one is one significant measure is we started building homes to Energy Star standards starting in uh, 1998. And by last year, two-thirds of our 1,500 affiliates nationwide are building new homes to meet Energy Star standards um, or sort of other higher performance guidelines for sustainable construction and green building. Um, so that, in fact, in our construction manual, that is something that we um, strongly encourage that affiliates um, build Energy Star standards. Um, and that is something that, that I think at this point um, almost all of our affiliates are doing, which, is, which has been great. Some of our affiliates are taking that a step farther um, um, and doing lead certified um, housing or um, meeting zero energy and passive house. Um, Institute USA standards, um, that's, you know, so there's sort of a wide range in terms of what affiliates are doing, and then some are also doing the weatherization, retrofit, sort of energy efficiency repair work as well. Um, I think one benefit that um, Habitat has to do the retrofit work is that um, we can do, if let's say a home um, not only has um, poor insulation and leaky um, doors and windows and that kind of thing, and a roof that's falling apart, we can do 
some of the rehab that's necessary on a house, such as repairing a roof or the infrastructure of a home, and seal the home as well to make it more energy efficient um, also. And so we're able to do the rehab and the energy efficiency repair as well. So I think having that capability to do both can be very advantageous because sometimes homes need um, not only just to be repaired and for the energy um, efficiency to be improved, but the actual um, structure of the house has to be rehabbed. Um, in terms of what's most cost efficient, I mean, I think ideally, you know, when you're building a new home, making it energy efficient to begin with um, is always always the best way to start. Um, so that way, when the family moves in, um, hopefully they have low they have low utility bills to begin with. Um, but of course, obviously, as Brad mentioned in the presentation, there are millions of homes that are that are energy inefficient and really need. Um, rehab and repair work. And so, um, you know, in the Habitat's model in recent years, especially since the housing crisis, we're doing a lot more rehab and repair work. Um, you know, certainly we're, we're still doing new construction, but we recognize with the foreclosure crisis, there was a lot of abandoned and foreclosed properties and neighborhoods. And so we had to start really, you know, examining what made sense for not just a one house at a time model, but a, a whole neighborhood. And so a, a number of affiliates have been looking at, um, you know, block by block, you know, neighborhoods and doing, um, you know, a number of rehab and repair projects. So that has included, you know, energy efficient related projects as well. And so, you know, I think the cost effectiveness, it's, it's sort of hard to say what's more cost effective. Um, it just, you know, I think it depend I think it's all all needed. Um, but I think obviously ideally when you build a new home, if you can um, you know, have those energy efficient measures already in there, uh, that's that's probably the, the ideal. Yeah, that's why building energy codes and, um, are so critically important. You know, Elizabeth, I uh, I wanted yeah. Oh, yeah. Those definitely. And on the on the existing home, I actually have a a couple um, real case examples of what we're doing. Um, you know, on a Michigan Habitat did reach out to us and said, "Hey, we're going to be um, doing some weatherization to older, way older existing homes." Um, and you know, it's it's you know, it's every home is a is a case by case, subjective basis. So I recommend every Habitat chapter who is going to be doing some weatherization projects, reach out to your local BPI, Building Performance Certified Professional, and have them utilize the um, uh, newly created, uh, well, it's not, it's it's been created quite a while ago, but sort of the, the program that's gaining traction is from the Department of Energy's Home Energy Score. And this, these BPI contractors can sign up for this and, and get this, get this uh, tool for free just by going through a couple exams. If they know what they're doing, they'll pass the quiz online. And what these BPI folks can help your chapter do on a case-by-case -case basis is to go into a home and do an energy model on it, size it up, and it's a very quick, simple one. It's not like the HERS index. And it, then it gives you, it spits out a score from a 1 to 10, so it lets you know how the home is doing in relative to other homes. And then what are some simple improvements that you can make that have less than a 10-year payback and where those need to be? Because, again, those are going to be um, very subjective on, on each home. Is that uh, sound advice or, or? No, that sounds very, very good advice. Uh, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for folks who are in this uh, space right now to make an impact. Uh, one of the most critical things is we need a louder voice. When you work in Washington, D.C., you see how the special interests uh, really do uh, gain a foothold for their, their interests, and we, we're just not doing that. Uh, we need folks to, uh, who, who care about these issues, uh, low-income energy efficiency, uh, to really speak out. I bet folks who are participating in this call are working on some very exciting new energy efficiency technologies, and members of Congress need to hear about that. They love success stories, particularly anything that's happened in their district. Invite them for a site visit. Uh, at the very least, go see the staff director in the uh, local office of a House member or, or senator 
And uh, we found in the case of weatherization, I mentioned uh, Senator Shaheen of uh, New Hampshire as being one of the great advocates. She's gone out on a number of site visits with our weatherization team in New Hampshire. Those, those really build an identification in a member of Congress's mind uh, for the value of a program. So I guess I would just conclude by, by urging everybody to, uh, to really take that up as a personal challenge of, of reaching out. Uh, we need a louder voice. Well, uh, thanks, Brad. Thanks, Elizabeth, for your time and for doing this. Um, we're going to go ahead and wrap the live session up um, for all of you. But uh, if you have any more questions, we're going to be sticking around here for a couple other things for those of you who want to pick up your continuing education credit. Uh, for those of you uh, listening on demand, thanks for listening in. Uh, make sure to take your continuing ed quiz after this session. Um, Brad and Elizabeth, thanks again. and. Um, uh, we're going to be uh, closing this down now, so take care. Thank you, Brett. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you so much.